All right. So we basically learned. Just I just introduced to you what the history of redemption is. Right, it's the entire story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and we learned about the structure of Genesis. Um, and I stress that the Bible is one single book, right, with one thread of meaning running throughout the Bible. So if, if the Bible is one unified book, then it must have a structure of its own, right? So I'm just going to give you that real quick, just to simplify the structure of the Bible so that you understand. Every, you know, good piece of writing, whether it be a book or essay or article or whatever, will have three parts to it, right? What are they? Introduction, body, and conclusion, right? Y'all learned that, right? So the Bible must also have that too. So the introduction of the Bible is Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Okay. Uh, theologically, that, is, that part is called the prime, primeval history, okay. which is not really important, but Genesis 1 through 11 basically lays out the introduction. The introduction is very important. Why? Because when you learn to write, what did you learn? That in the introduction, you lay out the map of what the writing is going to be about. You introduce what the point is going to be, and the supporting arguments, and the conclusion. It's all in there, right? It's all in the introduction. So if you understand Genesis 1 through 11, you can understand the whole Bible. If you understand the genealogies, you can understand the whole Bible. It's very simple. And then the body goes from Genesis 12. What's Genesis 12 about? Call of Abraham, right? Abraham is the main figure. Goes all the way to the book of Jude. And then obviously the conclusion is the book of Revelation. Right? So that's the basic simplified structure of the Bible. This is a very simplified structure. All right, so now the second lecture is about the line of Cain. Okay. Unfortunately, there's no handout for this lecture, so just you know, listen and take notes, but there's no handout there. So the line of Cain begins the line of the unfaithful. Okay. After Adam and Eve fell, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, right? What's the first thing that happened after they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden in the Bible? Genesis chapter 3 ends with Adam and Eve being kicked out. Right? And then Genesis 4 begins the first event or incident that happened after they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. What's the first thing? Hmm? Before the murder. Hmm? I don't remember. I can't understand it. Sorry. Yes? Work. Work. Work? Work? Yeah. Well, yeah, but what's the main event about? What's Genesis 4 about, the beginning part? What did, what did Cain and Abel do? They brought an offering to God. They brought an offering to God. It's worship. They were still worshiping God outside the Garden of Eden. So Cain and Abel, the two sons of Adam, brought each their own offering to God. And we know the story, right? God accepted Abel's offering. God did not accept Cain's offering. And because of that, Cain got angry. He was jealous, whatever. And what did he do? He killed Abel. Right? There's so many things here that we could be talking about. So many answers that need to be uncovered. Okay. So, why did God accept Abel's offering and not Cain's? What did you learn in Sunday school? Why did, why did God accept Abel's offering and not Cain's? Attitude? Okay. It will give a good offering. Wrong attitude. Wrong attitude. He had a bad attitude. 
What else? First fruits. Ooh, wow, you guys are smart. Have you ever heard the, the traditional answer is what? The traditional answer is that Cain's was a bloodless offering. Right? No blood in Cain's offering. Have you heard that? You guys have never heard that before? So Cain brought a grain offering, right? Cain was a farmer. So Cain brought a grain offering. And Abel brought, Abel was a shepherd, so he brought an offering of the flock. So the traditional theologians were saying that God accepted Abel's offering because there was blood in that offering. I'm here to tell you that that's wrong. Okay? Why is that wrong? We need to know. Why is it wrong? There are many things. I'll just tell you a couple of things. First from the, the words. The Hebrew word for the offering that Cain and Abel brought is minha. Okay, the Hebrew word there in Genesis 4. There are many Hebrew words for offerings. There are many different types of offerings. There's burnt offering, there's grain offering, there's peace offering, there's thanksgiving offering, there's voluntary offering, or sometimes it's called free will offering. Many different types of offerings in the Old Testament. The word that is used here is minha, which usually means gift or tribute you know what a tribute is? it's what an inferior person gives to a superior person it's what the people give to their king as like paying homage to their king or the weaker nations kings pay tribute to the stronger nation who conquers them right so you pay a tribute to the king for letting him live, etc. Right? That's what a tribute is. So that's what the original meaning of the word minha means. It comes from the Arabic root word, which means to lend, to loan something to someone. I lend you something for you to use. And from there, it developed into meaning offering. So when we give an offering to God, what are we saying? And this is not mine. God lent it to me. God gave it to me for me to use. I'm just giving back a portion to God, right? That's what it's saying. That's what an offering is. And we're the inferior ones giving a tribute to God, right? So that's what the original meaning of this word is. And then if you go to Leviticus chapter 2 verse 1, the word minha there is translated as grain offering. What's grain offering? That's what Cain brought. So Cain's offering was not wrong in that it didn't have any blood because in the Old Testament, minha usually means grain offering. Okay, so right there from the word itself, from the Hebrew word itself, we can see that it's not about the blood. In minha is usually something that you bring, an offering that it should be appropriate to your social standing and to your vocation, to what kind of job you have. So they brought the right offerings. Cain was a farmer, so he brought a grain offering. Abel was a shepherd, so he brought an offering from the flock. Nothing wrong with that. So what was the difference then? Why did God accept Abel's offering and not Cain's? And, and some of you guys said it. You guys were right. The difference was the word firstlings. Right? Abel brought the firstlings of the flock along with their fat portions. Right? Let's turn to Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. So Genesis 
four, verses three and four says, So it came about, or, and in the process of time it came to pass, that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. And then verse 4 says, what is that verse 4? And then verse 5 says, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So, you see the difference when you read it? Cain brought what? It says Cain brought an offering. Right? Just an offering. Cain brought an offering. Just whatever he had in his pocket. <coughs> oh, here, I have a couple of dollars. I'll just put it in the basket. It's just an offering. But what did Abel bring? Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock. So bringing the firstborn takes a lot of planning. You gotta sit there. Well, who's gonna give birth to the firstborn? Oh, that one. That's what I'm gonna give to God. You gotta set that aside. It takes a lot of devotion, right? It takes work. And also, what else? What else did Abel bring? Firstborn and their fat. Why did Abel bring the fat? Because he wanted a lean diet. <laughs> so he gave the fat to God. You take the fat, God. <laughs> Today, fat is bad for us. We don't like it. When you have steak, you cut away the fat. In ancient times, Fat was the best part. It was the best of the best. Okay? The word for fat in Hebrew is heleb. Heleb. H-E-L-E-B. Heleb. There you go. Okay? And sometimes this word is translated as finest. Okay? This word is used in many places, but one example is Psalm 81, 16. Okay, if you look, if you could show that verse. Psalm 81, 16 says, the finest of the wheat, right? The finest of the wheat. And the word finest there in Hebrew is halev, right? There you go. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat, right? The word finest there is halev. So literally it's saying he fed them with the fat of the wheat, the best part. So when you look at the Hebrew text of Genesis 4, it's showing us that Abel brought the first and the best of what he had, whereas Cain just brought whatever he had in his pocket. The crumpled up dollar bill. When offering time comes, do we do that? I see that not a lot of not a lot of people are looking up. They can't look. <laughs> that was the difference. Okay. So when you bring the firstborn of the flock, what you're saying is you're acknowledging that God is the author and the owner of life. That's what Abel did. He's acknowledging that it was God who gave this to him. He's the author and the owner of life. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, please. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Can we all read this together? Ready? Begin. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Amen. Right? Honor God with our possessions, with the first fruits of our increase. So this is the kind of faith that God wants from us. Faith like Abel, where we honor God with our possessions by giving the first and the best that we have to Him. Right? But Cain was, you know, use the best for myself and whatever I have left over, I'll give to God. Why not? But another thing that we need to understand, if we go back to Genesis 4, if you read the Bible carefully, the answer is all there. What does it say? 
that God, verse 4 says, Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, the second half says, the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. And then verse 5 says, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So God accepted Abel and his offering. God did not accept Cain and his offering. There are two things there, right? The person himself and their offering. So it was not the offering that he rejected, but it was the person that God rejected. He rejected Cain himself. He accepted Abel himself. You, you see what I'm saying? It was the person, not the offering. Does it matter how much of an offering you give? Will God not accept you if you give too little? Is it, is, is it the value of the offering that matters? Remember what Jesus said about the widow and her two copper coins? Remember that in Luke chapter 21? He said, she gave the most. Because even though the, the worth of that offering is nothing, to her it's everything. Right? So it's not about the value, right? What is it about? The offering reveals yourself. The offering is a reflection of yourself. The offering reveals your heart. So God rejected Cain's heart, accepted Abel's heart. God rejected Cain's faith. God accepted Abel's faith. And that showed in the offering. So the value or the worth of the offering does not matter, right? Or does it? Let's go to Matthew 6, 21. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And before that, I talked about Luke 21, verses 1 and the following. I talked about the, the widow's offering of the two mites, or the two copper coins. Which is like two little pennies, right? Almost worthless. So, the value of the offering actually does not matter, but in a sense also, it does. Why? Because what Matthew 6, 21 is saying is that, the offering reveals your heart. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart, heart will be. The most important thing in your life, your heart is there, right? So if you think, oh, God only sees my heart and my faith, so it doesn't matter, I could just give a dollar or a penny or whatever. He doesn't care, right? Yes, that's true, but also the flip side of that is, where your treasure is, where your most valued possession is, that's where your heart will be. Your heart goes with that, right? The most important thing in your life, that's where your heart is, right? So you have to give that to God. That's what God wants, right? So for yourself, whatever is valuable for yourself, that's what God wants us to give to him because with that will come your heart. But for Cain, that didn't happen. Okay? That's why God rejected Cain's offering. Now, the second part after that, so Cain's offering was rejected. Cain got angry. Why did God not accept my offering? And he got jealous. What should Cain have done here? What should have been Cain's right reaction? Hmm? What should he have done? Anyone? 
Repent. 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 Okay, find out why. How, how should he have found out? How can he find out? Ask who? God? Or? No. Whose offering was accepted? If you want to find out the right answer, you ask the person who got the right answer. Right? He should have gone to Abel, his younger brother. And to do that, it means to kind of humble yourself, right? Lower yourself. Why do I, why do I, and also Reverend Everett Park, what he said was, Cain should have gone to Abel and asked him to mediate and give Cain's offering to God on his behalf. That's the way to be accepted. That, was, that should have been what Cain should have done, but he didn't do that. Why do we say that that's the right answer? Why do I know that that's the right answer? We're trying to discover Jesus in the Old Testament, right? Where is Jesus here? The story about Cain and Abel is a foreshadowing about the story of Israel and Jesus. Abel's faith foreshadows Jesus Christ. Okay? So, Jesus, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, he came up from the Jordan. What happened? It says, the heavens were opened, the Spirit came upon him like a dove and remained on him. So, the Spirit, the dove, the Spirit remained on him. It didn't leave. It was with him forever. And the heavens were opened. The Greek grammar reveals that it was opened not just open once and closed, but it remained open. So Jesus was somebody who always had a, this line of connection with God. Jesus prays, God answered. Like that. Jesus gives offering, God accepts. That's who Jesus was. And the Israelites, especially the religious leaders, if they were honest to themselves, they would have known, oh, my prayer doesn't get answered like that. My worship doesn't get accepted like that. But this guy does. Who is this guy? He didn't go to a famous seminary. He doesn't have a doctorate degree. He comes from Nazareth. What good could come out of Nazareth? Right? So they looked down upon him, right? And then in fact, why did they kill him? Pilate knew that it was out of what? Envy that they killed Jesus. Just like Cain was envious and jealous of Abel, the religious leaders of Israel were envious and jealous of Jesus. But what should have happened is when they saw that the heavens were open to him, that God was answering him, that the voice, they heard the voice, right? At the baptism, what was the voice? What did the voice say? This is my son in whom I am well pleased, right? They saw and heard all of these you know, proof evidence that he was the one. He sh they should have gone to him to mediate for them. That's what Cain should have done. That's what the Israelites should have done. That didn't happen. So you see, Cain and Abel's offering foreshadows what's going to happen. What? 4,000 years later when Jesus comes. So Cain's heart was filled with anger and jealousy, and that's what was unacceptable to God. Can we just briefly show Genesis 4, 7? Do you have the NIV version of that? Genesis 4, 7. So if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? This is what God says. So the point is not the offering, but Cain. God is saying, if you do what's right, I will accept you. 
You should go through Abel. He knows what I want. Ask him. Jesus knows what, what God wants. So we go through him. When we pray, we pray in his name. Right? He is the one that we need to go through. Okay? So this is uh, what happened with Cain and Abel's offering. So, <coughs> Cain now killed his brother. And God comes to him and says, what have you done? Where is your brother? And he says, oh, am I my brother's keeper? You know. And the blood of Abel was crying out to God. Now we're going into the lineage of Cain. Cain's lineage begins in Genesis 4, 16. What kind of lineage or genealogy is this? Genesis 4, 16 says, So Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, right? And lived in the land of God, east of Eden. So the genealogy of Cain is a Cain that begins, or is a genealogy that begins by leaving the presence of God. Okay? The genealogy of Cain is, is a genealogy that begins by leaving the presence of God. They, he left God. God is everywhere. How can you leave his presence? It's talking about his heart. Right? His, he was not acknowledging God anymore. He left. And then his first son is named Enoch. And what did Cain do? Cain built a city and named it after his son. This is the first city that human beings built. First, the first sign of civilization. And it was a civilization that was human-centered, apart from God. So it starts from here. You could draw a straight line all the way through. The city that Cain built named Enoch, the Tower of Babel, all the way to Revelation 18, What's in Revelation 18? Babylon. So the story of the Bible can be described as a story of the city of God versus the city of man. Right? That's what Augustine was talking about. All of these human beings built human civilizations saying, I don't need God. This is a declaration of independence. I could be away from God. I don't need you. Forget you, man. I can just live on my own. We can do fine with human strength. That's how the lineage of Cain begins. The Tower of Babel is the same thing, right? The word Babel in Hebrew, Babel, is the same word for Babylon. Did you guys know that? Babel is the same word for Babylon. They built the Tower of Babel. What was the purpose? They wanted to reach heaven on their own and make a name for themselves without God's help. Reaching heaven on their own meaning save themselves. That's salvation, right? I could go to heaven without God's help. I could get eternal life without God's help. Just go find the fountain of youth or... You know, with that plant or whatever you eat, then you can live forever, right? Those are all human-centered means of reaching heaven on their own. That's what the Tower of Babel is about. And then eventually in the book of Revelation, what does God say? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. So it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. If you go up two verses to verse 2, it's talking about the fall of Babylon, right? Revelation 18.2 says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, right? And then God is saying in verse 4, Come out of her, come out of Babylon. Otherwise, you're going to partake of their sins and you're going to receive their plagues. This is almost at the end of Revelation. That's like the conclusion. Remember, well, well, what's the introduction of the Bible? Genesis 1 through what? 
11, right? What's Genesis 11 about? The Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, the first part is about the Tower of Babel. The second part is about the genealogy of Shem. We're going to study about that tomorrow. So out of Babel or Babylon, who comes out? Shem's 10th generation. The culmination of Shem's genealogy is who? Abraham. So the conclusion of Genesis 11 is about Abraham coming out of Babylon. The conclusion of Revelation is God's holy people, his faithful people coming out of Babylon. So that's where we're living in right now. The world is Babylon. God's calling us out to become Abraham's descendants. Come out of her, my people. Become Abraham's descendants. Don't partake in her sins. That is around us. Now the lineage of Cain provides the backdrop why? Because the lineage of Cain is about the world. Okay? So, let's go back to Genesis 4. That's where the lineage of Cain is listed, right? So, if you could have my iPad on the screen. It begins with Cain. Okay. It begins with Cain. His son was Enoch. Enoch's son was Irad. Irad had a son named Mahujael. And then Mahujael had a son named Methushael. And then Methushael had a son named Lamech. And then Lamech had three sons. Jabal. Jubal and Tubal Cain and a daughter named Nama. But we'll just talk about the sons. So Cain's lineage ends abruptly in the seventh generation. Lamech and his three sons. Okay? And what does the Bible say about Lamech, this guy? This guy's important because he's so bad. He's so wicked. So let's go to Genesis 4, uh, verse 21, I believe. It starts with 19. So in verse 19, it says, Lamech was the first polygamist in the Bible. What is a polygamist? Having more than one wife, right? So he had two wives. The first polygamist in the Bible. So he turned this holy sanctified matrimony wedding between a man and a woman and he turned it into something very bad, right? And then he had these three sons. What, what did the sons do? First of all, Jabal was the father of the, those who dwell in tents. That, I'm in Genesis chapter 4, verse 20 now. Jabal was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So Jabal was a pioneer in animal husbandry and livestock, okay? He was the first guy to really do this well. You can imagine how rich he must have been, right? He was the first person to do this. His second son, Jubal, verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who played the lyre and pipe. He was the pioneer of musicians. But this, we can conjecture it, that this was not a music to praise God. It was the kind of music that was very sensual and, you know, sinful. And because if you look at the Hebrew word for the word pipe there, it comes from a root word which means uh, like sensual pleasure. Okay, so that's the kind of music that he pioneered. So he was probably very famous and wealthy, right? And then the third son was Tubal Cain. What did he do in verse 22? He was the forger of all implements of bronze and iron. Can you imagine? He was the first guy to make tools of bronze and iron. Not just tools. What else do you think they made with that? Weapons, right? Weapons. 
He was the first arms dealer <laughs> of the world, yeah. And then from verse 23 and verse 24, verses 23 and 24 is a little song that Lamech wrote. Let's read this song. It's a very interesting song. Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zilla, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. This is Hebrew poetry. It's a song. What I want to think of this as, it's the first gangster rap song. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody who likes gangster rap. So please do not be offended if you're a fan of hip hop or gangster rap or whatever. But you know there's those gangster rap songs, what do they say? Uh, listen you derogatory term for women. That's what he's saying, right? Listen, you wives of Lamech. I put a cap in a guy for hitting me. I killed this guy. Yeah. Right? Am I wrong? That's what he's saying here. He's glorifying murder. That's what a lot of gangster rap songs do today, right? It glorifies murder. This guy was the first one to do that. He came before Dr. Dre or whatever. <laughs> so nothing has changed. This is 6,000 years ago today. Nothing has changed. So what the line of Cain is showing us is providing the backdrop upon which the line of the faithful, the line of Seth, will have to live their lives. This is where they're living. And we'll learn tomorrow when we talk about Noah. Their lineage was powerful, they're rich, and they spread out so fast that sin pro proliferated at a, a rate that is so quick that it, just, it covered the whole world by the time of Noah's day. And during that kind of uh, a backdrop, that is where the lineage of Seth had to keep their faith and live a life that is set apart from the world that's around them. The same thing is happening today. This is the kind of the world that we're living in right now, right? This is the kind of world where we need to live a life of faith. We need to be different. It's not easy, right? And we will see that a lot, even of the line of Seth, fell away from faith. So that's what the line of Cain is all about. It provides the backdrop. This is how the world was back then, and it foreshadows the world that we're living in right now. That's why the Bible calls it Babylon. It's just like it was back then. Okay? That is the line of Cain. So the line of Cain in some, this is what I can say about the line of Cain. It begins by leaving the presence of God, right? And it has a completely different mode of lifestyle than the line of Seth. The line of Cain has a completely different lifestyle. There is not a single mention about God. It's all about human achievements and pride and the glorification of sin. So, from a worldly perspective, Lamech's sons were very successful people. All right? Pioneers of animal husbandry, pioneers in music, pioneers in bronze and iron, weapons and tools. Very successful people. They probably were very famous. And Lamech probably used the weapons that his son Tubal Cain made to kill this guy. And so by singing this song, what we could conjecture is that Lamech was heroizing himself. 
He was making himself out to be a hero. This is how powerful I am. Don't mess with me. And what happens when somebody is heroized and deified like this? People flock to them, right? People flock to powerful people. So they probably had a very big following. He was apparently very powerful. And even though the record in the Bible stops right here, spiritually speaking, we could say it continues on through people like Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10. Have you ever all heard of Nimrod? One of the descendants of Ham. It says in Genesis chapter 10 verses 8 and the following, it says he was the first mighty man on earth, right? He began to be a mighty one on the earth, right? And he was a mighty hunter before God. Where it says he was a mighty hunter before God, it means it doesn't mean that he was hunting for God. It meant that he went against God. He was hunting and hurting and persecuting God's people. And most likely Nimrod was the leader who organized the building of the Tower of Babel. Nimrod was the guy who built the Tower of Babel. How do we know that? If you go to verse 10, where was Nimrod's kingdom? Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kelna, in the land of Shinar. And if you go to Genesis 11, 1, where was the Tower of Babel built? In the land of Shinar. In Nimrod's kingdom. So do you think they could have built that without Nimrod's permission? No. Nimrod was the ruler of this kingdom, so he probably was the guy who started the, the building of the Tower of Babel. It was a direct challenge against God. So these are the lineage of Cain, and it's still continuing on even today, right now. They're the ones who are in opposition to God and to us, because we're the ones who are trying to keep the faith, right? So, you know, I guess as Sun Tzu said, you need to know your enemy and know yourself, right? This is who we are, we are, we are not fighting in the worldly sense, but this is the opposition that we have to deal with, the lineage of Cain. Okay? So any questions? Any questions? Yes? Why would God give them such talents? That's something I want to call common grace. Okay? Have you heard of the term common grace? There's common grace and there's special grace. Okay? Have you heard of that? Special grace is the grace given to us to be able to believe in God. You know that faith is not our own, right? Faith is a gift from God. We're not believing just because we want to believe. We believe because God gave us the grace to believe. But God has given common grace to all people. He has given various talents to different people in different ways. So God just chose to give this kind of talent to these people, certain different kinds of talents to these people. So God has given to all of us grace according to each of our abilities. What you do with that talent is up to you, right? With these people, they didn't do, they didn't use those talents to glorify God, but they used it to oppose God. And not only that, God is still continuing to give Cain and his descendants a chance to repent and come back to God. So when God drove Cain away, right, he gave him a mark on the forehead, right? It says whoever takes a vengeance upon Cain will will be punished sevenfold, right? So God's protection is still upon Cain and his descendants. Because even Cain comes from Adam, right? They're still part of God's, they're still God's children. So it's what we choose to do with our talents that God has given to us. But God is letting them flourish like this for a reason. Okay? God is letting them flourish like this so that in the end, He will be glorified by what? By those who are weak 
in the world, by those who are small in the world, by those who are few in the world, to, uh, to put to shame the strong and the powerful in the world. So this is all part of the drama of Scripture. God is he's creating a movie here. And the movie gets exciting when the bad guy is really powerful. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. Any other questions? <coughs> yes. You mentioned Cain left and built a city in Enoch. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Cain left and built a city in Enoch. To build a city, you need with, um, lots of people. Yes. And how does it happen then? Okay, that's a very good question. Very controversial question throughout history. Where did all these people come from, right? Yes. What do you think? There are many answers out there. What do you think? One of the answers is that Adam and Eve had many other descendants besides Cain and Abel. Right? Because how long did Adam live? 930 years, right? That's a long time. So they had many children. So it was probably his other cousins or brothers and sisters or whatever and cousins that came to build the city together. But then that kind of doesn't make sense too, right? I mean, that means those all all those children of Adam also left the presence of God, right? And rebelled against God. So what other explanation could there be? <laughs> Any, anybody want to take a guess at it? This is a very controversial subject right now within the theological world. So for example, have you guys ever heard of a, a, a scholar named Bruce Waltke? American Old Testament theologian. Okay. He was an Old Testament professor teaching at a, a seminary called Reformed Theological Seminary, which is where I, I went to school. And he made this bold and daring claim. He said Adam and Eve were not the first physical human beings in the world. <laughs> What do you think happened to him? <laughs> there, there was some pressure, so he quit because he thought he was going to get fired. And then there's another guy, I think, like, you know, there's, now there are a couple of people that are coming out. There's a, a, a group called BioLogos, who are Christian scientists who are doing research with genetics, DNA, etc. And they figured out a way to go all the way back and they figured out that Adam could not have been the first human being. Does that, whatever the answer is, I don't know. We can't really know the answer, right? But whatever the answer is, it would not affect the inerrancy and the infallibility of the Bible as God's word. So, what they're trying to say is this. The Bible is ne never claiming explicitly that Adam was the very first human being, but he was the very first human being to believe in God. How would that change what the Bible says? So, I mean, there is no right answer here. Okay. But what the conservative scholars are saying is that Adam and Eve had many children. That's who Cain married. Cain married his sister. Abel also married his sister, right? If he got married before he died. And that's how he had children. And the other children of Adam had many other children. And those are the ones who built the city of Enoch. That's one theory. Okay. 
So I'm just letting you know what's out there in the theological world. Okay? But what is the most important thing? What is the most important thing? It's that God's word is inerrant and infallible. Right? If we have, if we can stand on that firm ground, whatever theories may come, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't shake us, right? If we can only stand on that firm ground, okay? So the answer is in the Bible. How do you interpret the Bible? Using science? Using other knowledge or theories? How do you interpret the Bible? What is the right way to interpret the Bible? Scripture is interpreted through Scripture. So you find the answer in the Bible, right? Reverend Aaron Park said the same thing, but he put it in a different way. He said, the Bible, everything in the Bible has mates. You find the mates, there you'll find the answers. Old Testament has New Testament. Old Testament has other parts of the Old Testament that explains all of these things. We just haven't found it yet. So, don't go to outside of the Bible, but find it in the Bible. Then we'll have the answer. So those are the two possible answers to your question. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anybody else? Yes. I want to ask about the book of Genesis. Like, okay. Do we read it literally? Because some. Um, yeah. Do we read the book of Genesis literally? Like, take it as the facts itself. Okay. Because there are people who say that it is, there are people who say that it's not. Mm -hmm. The reason why is there will be a problem, like, um, even if Adam and Eve are not the first men. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are many more. But when it comes to Noah's, um, you know, after the flood itself, then um, multiplication will have to come from the family. Right. So why did it happen that way? Because it's not moral. Um, well, I mean, Noah's sons were married before the flood. So they went into the ark with their, with their wives. So they multiplied that way. Um, but what you're saying is like, you know, Cain had to marry his sister, so that's incest, right? So do we read the Bible or Genesis literally? Um, see, that's the modern way of thinking. When Moses wrote this, they, wrote, they, were, they had a different way of thinking than we do right now. So if you were to ask Moses, are we to take this literally? He wouldn't understand what that means. But, and then there are all these theories out there, right? No, it's not. It's, it's symbolic. It's literal. It's whatever. Typological. Allegorical. Etc. What I want to say is we need to read it spiritually. Okay? When I say spiritually, I mean the literal has to be taken into account. Okay? So I, I think the Bible has two sides to it. The literal and the spiritual. Both have to match. Both have to make sense. You can't spiritualize it too much. You can't make it too literal either. And you take away the spiritual. And that, that wouldn't make sense either, right? So you need a balance of the literal and the spiritual. And, I mean... To answer your question would take a whole week, literally, <laughs> to go into like interpretation and hermeneutic issues, right? But there is a spiritual aspect to the literal, and they're intricately connected. You can't separate them two, right? So the literal has to make sense, but also the spiritual has to make sense as well. So for example, as I was talking about Cain and Abel, right? Spiritually, it foreshadows Jesus Christ. Jesus is there underlying all of these literal stories. Right? We need to find Jesus there. Right? So there is a point that God is trying to get across to us. It's a timeless point. Even if we're 6,000 years apart from that story, it still has to make sense to us. It still has to apply to us. Right? So you, there is the literal aspects, but there are certain parts that you have to take away. The cultural aspects, the legal aspects, you, 
You strip away at all of these layers and you will come at the core of what God is trying to get at to us. And it will apply to everybody and every time in history. Whether you're American, Singaporean, Chinese, Korean, or whatever, it doesn't matter. It has to apply to every culture at every time, right? And if you take it too literally, that won't happen, right? Because certain cultures don't understand those kinds of things. This is written from a Hebrew perspective, right? So you have to kind of strip away those layers to get to the core that applies to everybody in the world. So, but, you, but we cannot ignore the literal as well. Okay? So I don't know if this will make sense to you, but that's the only answer I could give in five minutes. <laughs> Anybody else? Is there a time off? Time's off. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, can you explain Genesis 3, verse 3? Genesis 3, what? Verse 20. 20. Is that about the naming of Eve? What do you want to know about that? She was the mother of all the living. Uh-huh. The word all. All? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, so, yes. So you're saying that, that she has to be the mother of all human beings. They have to be the first human beings. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you were asking? Um, so... Uh, the, uh, someone asked a while ago, uh, um, does anyone have uh, other people before Adam and Eve? Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this verse that uh, she was the mother of all the people. So it contradicts for me. So this verse proves that Adam was the very first human being, right? I think. But you think no, right? It, there's contradictions in the Bible. You're thinking that if Adam could not have been the first human being, so this verse contradicts that. That's what you're trying to say. Okay? If that were the case, that's a big if. Who are all the living? <laughs> Let's go to Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus gives us the answer. Matthew 22, verse 32. Can, can you, what's your name, sir? China. China, can you read that for us? Matthew 22. 32. Matthew chapter 22, verse 32. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. Okay, so what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So Jesus is implying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are what? Living. Living. That's what Jesus is saying. So in the Bible, the definition of the living or who? It's different from what we're thinking, right? Not physically breathing, but spiritually alive, having faith like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? That doesn't necessarily mean that you know, you're right about Adam and Eve, but I'm just saying there's no answer to that. To tell you the truth, there is no right answer. I can. We have another question here. Is there any debate on whether Cain was the firstborn? I didn't get the first part. Is, is there, there any debate oh. on whether Cain was the firstborn? Uh, I think there is, but I don't think it's very significant. They could explain all the other things. All the other people meaning. So when Cain uh, so Abel, he said, uh, other people were hurt me. Oh, yeah, yeah. That means there, Adam had other children, right? Before. Oh, before Cain. Well, actually, Cain could have been the firstborn, and there could have been a long time that had passed. Right? 
right? So we don't know how old Cain and Abel were at this point. They could have been hundreds of years old. <laughs> so they had, Adam and Eve had a lot of time to procreate. They didn't have internet back then. So. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we gotta end, right? <laughs>